Hello, hello, hello. I had to pull over and put my coat back on because it was freezing. I like walked out of the house without my coat on because I thought that my car was warm. I had like pre-warmed it and um, I got in my car and it was like freezing still. So I was like, okay, I gotta put my coat back on. It is, it says right now, oh, in this polar vortex that it is a negative four degrees outside, but it, it feels much colder than that. And it's super windy outside. Um, but I don't think we got hit as hard as other people did. It was cold today, but it wasn't as, like throughout the middle of the day, it was cold, but it didn't feel like sub-zero, even though it was. But anyway, so, let's talk about my day, shall we? <laughs> did you guys watch my video I did on my Peter Mon channel? So I um, got up today and I had my dental appointment for my deep cleaning and that appointment was from 11 to 1. I got there like 10 minutes early and uh, just got it started right away. It was, the cleaning itself was like, okay, it wasn't incredibly horrible, but it was pretty bad. Like, it was worse than I thought it was gonna be, honestly. Like, first of all, we I had to get all these shots and that wasn't like, like, I don't have a problem with shots, but I wasn't expecting to get as many shots as I did, and it just kind of kept on going and going and going. And the other thing was, the dental hygienist, she was okay, but she like, she didn't really give me any breaks throughout the whole thing. Like, she just kept on going and going, and like, I was t telling Tanya about this today, and she's like, oh, I always tell the dentist, dental hygienist before, um, my appointments that I have to have breaks. She's like, because I just can't go for long periods of time without them stopping. And like, it had been a while since, you know, I had had a cleaning and I had, I've never had a deep cleaning like this. It's two hours long. So I didn't really know what to expect. And the dental hygienists that I've had in the past, honestly, were so good that they always gave me like little breaks, you know, like they'd say, okay, I'm gonna just stop for a couple minutes and let you relax and whatever. She, this girl did not do this today at all. She just kept on going straight through. And um, I don't know, I just, I wasn't prepared for it. And it so it wasn't so much that it was like this horrific pain. It was kind of like, it was just this ongoing discomfort, if that makes sense. Needless to say, by the end of it, I was ready to be done with the whole thing. Um, although, it's interesting because they said that my teeth would be really sore later, and my teeth haven't been sore at all today. So, um, I mean, I haven't had to take any ibuprofen or anything like that. It's been completely fine, so. I've been really tired today, um, and I got a, you know, I got some okay sleep, even though I slept straight through the night again last night, but, um, I just was exhausted all day today. So after that, I was, like, wanting to come home and just, um, like, rest and not really do anything. And I had to, I was waiting because she called in like this mouthwash stuff for me. So I was waiting for this mouthwash to be called in to the pharmacy to go pick up. And um, that was weird. There was like a light out there in the middle of the woods. It's kind of spooky, isn't it? Um, so I uh, had to wait for that. And so I was, that's when I called Tanya. And um, I was actually like in this parking lot and I made this like rant video about going to the dentist. And then um, like while I was doing the rant video, I talked, I, I, like Tanya had texted me so I called her and um, she was like, well why don't you stop by the kennel while you're waiting? So I stopped by the kennel and um, went and saw her and then I went and picked up the mouthwash from the pharmacy and yeah. And then I went home and I uploaded the video and took the dogs out and stuff like that. So the dogs today wanted to run outside. Like they had like no kind of like consciousness about how freezing it was. And they like ran to the very end of the yard where like the woods is and I had to like run down there and go get them. And little Pee Pee was trying to poop so hard and he was so cold and so I finally just like picked him up and 
I felt so bad for him and um, but Bradley didn't seem bothered. But Tucker, like, he finally started coming in and you could tell, like, his paws were cold. I mean, and this is literally, I'm not lying, like, they were out there maybe three or four minutes and that's how cold it was. And, um, so Tucker was, like, coming up to the door. I picked him up first and brought him inside because you could tell his little paws were hurting him. And, um, but, but Boo Radley was just, like, running all around the yard. Like, he didn't bother him at all. He just came running in with me when I picked up Pee-Pee. So, yeah. All the schools, everything was canceled today. It was weird. It was kind of like when I was driving around today, there was like nobody out or anything. It was like dead outside. And um, it was just like crazy. Very few people. Like, I mean, I guess like when I was at the dentist today, she said that almost everybody, like all their appointments had canceled today. Which it was cold, but it wasn't, I mean, it didn't feel like cold, like you couldn't like go out and actually, you know, do, get stuff done. I honestly thought that it would be like so cold outside because they were saying that it was like colder than it had been in like 30 years or something in Indianapolis. I honestly thought that it would be like so cold that you couldn't even like walk outside for two seconds, you know what I mean? But it wasn't like that, not at all. And I, like during the, today, like middle of the day, it was like two degrees, five degrees, and then again tonight it dropped down low again and got really, really cold. I know in other areas in the Midwest, it's a lot colder than it is here. And then I think tomorrow it's supposed to be a little bit warmer. I don't know. I didn't look. Hopefully. Hopefully. My teeth do feel really clean though. It's kind of weird. Like, I can feel we're all, like, she's like, you have so much tartar that we got to get taken care of. So much buildup. And I have been listening to a new audiobook today, although I couldn't listen to it at the dentist. I was trying to at the beginning, and she kept on asking me stuff, and so I'd have to pause it, and I couldn't really see what I was doing when I was pausing it. So... I like switched it over to music. So I've been listening tonight. It's called The Vanishing Staircase. I got food and I came home and I was watching the Ted Bundy tapes on Netflix. You know, I have to say, I'm kind of bored of those, honestly. Like, they're not super interesting to me. Um, After having read the Ann Rule book, the Ted Bundy tapes on Netflix just aren't that interesting. I feel like I know so much of the case, you know? That stuff that they're saying is either contradictory to what I already knew, or, I don't know, maybe it'll get better. I just got onto the second episode. I thought the first episode was boring. Um, but I've talked to a couple people and they said that the first episode is kind of boring, so. I don't know, maybe the second episode gets better, I hope. It can only get better, because the first episode was not that great. Now it's negative six degrees, it says. But I'm kind of like more out in the country now. Can you guys believe tomorrow is the last, well, when you're watching this, it's the last day of January. It feels so weird, doesn't it? It feels like January went really, really fast. I mean, honestly, it just feels like it was Christmas yesterday. I gotta talk to Tanya tomorrow because I was asking her on Tuesday, this like service position thing that, uh, or service meeting that she went to, that I went to with her last week. Well, actually it's her sponsee's service position. And um, so it's like she signed us up for it to go, but I didn't say that I would go this week, but I was telling Tanya on Tuesday, I said, I think it'd be kind of nice to go back to that again. I like, I, I really liked going and she was like, yeah, she was like, um, call me on Thursday and, or she was like, let me know on Thursday if you want to go or not. Cause I haven't decided if I'm going to go. It depends on how cold it is. 
Well, you know it's gonna be cold. I mean, it's January, come on, tiny jam. But anyway, somebody asked me in the comments, they asked me how often I do uh, service work and recovery. Um, the last five or six years I've done quite a bit. Um, so it's, so my sponsor like me to hold a service position. Like I don't have to hold one every year, but like every other year, like a year long position. Um, and so this is the year that I have to pick up a year. There's, I haven't run into any positions that are available right now. But two years ago, it was actually when I was vlogging, um, I had a service position and um, it was like a meeting representative. And so I would have to go like the second Sunday, I think, of every month and then take back the information to the meeting. But there's like tons of ways to do service position. I mean, there's like lots of service that you can do in recovery. You can, you know, chair a meeting, you can secretary a meeting, you can, you know, but so a lot of the meetings that I go to though, those are like positions that you hold for a year and those positions aren't up right now. Um, there's two different kinds of service positions within meetings. Um, other than that, that are like representatives. Those are like usually a year or two. Uh, so that position that I had was a two year position. Um, and then that like the end of that tail end of that year going into the next year, I was also like, I chaired this meeting for a year. Um, so I had to go there every Wednesday night. That meeting doesn't exist anymore. That kind of makes me sad. They ended up closing that meeting down, but um, I had to go and set that meeting up every Wednesday night. What's that before that? I think that was before I was vlogging. I mean, service position, that's doing service and recovery is kind of a broad, you know, spectrum. Like when I got sober, it was like cleaning ashtrays because every meeting was almost, a, almost every meeting was a smoking meeting back in the day. And, um, you know, they would have like a lot of places that we would go like union halls and stuff like that for meetings. They would have glass mugs. I mean, it's different um, a lot now than when I first got sober, you know, a, a lot of the places are different and I'm sure it's not in smaller towns maybe, but like in Indianapolis, it's a lot different. I don't know though. I don't, you know, I don't know what it's like in smaller towns, but like in Indianapolis, there's, there's no smoking meetings here. Like they're unheard of. Um, which is weird because when I got sober, like every meeting was a smoking meeting that you went to. Some meetings that you would go to would be like smoking, non-smoking. Like they would have like, like two, the meeting would separate and they would have a smoking meeting and they would have a non-smoking meeting. Um, but now, I mean, obviously, you know, none of the meetings are smoking anymore. And the other thing is, is that like coffee, like a lot of the places I used to go, which would be like church basements, which I still do, um, but, or like a union hall, like union halls host lots of recovery meetings and you pay them rent for using the meeting. Um, like a, you pay a church rent for using their facility for like that hour or whatever. And, um, but we used to use like glass mugs. We don't do that anymore like ceramic mugs, you know, for coffee. And so we, like one of the positions that would be, would be like somebody would clean out all the coffee mugs at the end or clean out all the ashtrays, you know, put up all the chairs. Now we kind of just all do that. My home group meeting used to be at a union hall and um, it was really fun there actually. And then I can't remember what happened, like, something happened with the union hall, union hall, like it didn't have anything to do with us. And they like voted that they weren't gonna like rent out their space to like people that didn't have anything to do with the union, I think anymore or something like that, I can't remember. So we had to find another place and now that's why we go to this church that we go to on Tuesday nights. Um, and we, we rent out like their, it's like their gym that we have. It's like a carpeted gym, it's weird. It has like a basketball court in there, but it's like carpeted. It's huge. So yeah, um, I think service is important in sobriety. I mean, there's lots of different ways you can do it, you know? You can read 
meet at the beginning of a meeting. There's always readings that you can do. Um, you can, you know, sponsor people, you know. There's all kinds of things that you can do. And, and, and honestly, a lot of the things that, you know, that I've done or service work that I've done or whatever um, or do, I don't necessarily talk about on my vlog. Um, but, like, one of the things is, like, taking meetings. So, like, a lot of, like, home groups will take meetings into, like, facilities or treatment facilities or half houses or and they'll sign up for like a month so like you know one meeting might have January and the next meeting might have February does that make sense and so then um, like so our group this is how it is is responsible for taking a meeting to a certain place and so this woman that Tanya sponsors she is like in charge of that for January so she had to get people to go with her and um, and it ended up being so many people last week. It was great. Anyway, I'd like to do that again. So, I don't know. If Tanya goes tomorrow night, I'll probably go. If she doesn't, I might reach out to her sponsor and see. I just, I felt good doing that. Um, so, yeah. It's interesting because... You know, I talk a lot about reading and stuff. I don't know if I said it on here or if I said it on a booktube video. But I didn't even realize it. Like, until I said it. That, like, I read so much recovery literature. Every day I read a lot of recovery literature. I mean, besides meditation books and stuff like that. And, um... like trying to, I feel like there's no heat coming on my legs and I have it set to be on my legs. Oh, because it's not right now. Um, so anyway, um, I read a lot of recovery literature. I read a lot about like emotional sobriety and, um, and it's like 12 step approved literature and, um, there's a magazine that comes out every month, a recovery magazine that I always read. And, um, you know, like my basic text and there's just like all kinds of like, um, you know, extended literature, tons and tons and tons of it, you know? And, um, my sponsors really, she, actually, I have a book back here that she gave me. Um, she's always giving me books to read and, you know, and she'll say, okay, when should you read this? And then we're going to talk about it. And I'm like, okay. So like, that's a lot of the reading that I do that I actually don't talk about, um, I don't, like, count that as a book that I read, you know? Um, but that's a lot of reading that I do. I probably do, you know, a half an hour to an hour of that every day. I just sit there on the couch and read some of it. I think it's important, you know? It's like... <clears throat> I think whatever you, like, do in life, you know, whether it's a hobby or whether it's a passion whether it's your career, I think to continue to stay educated, I think is important, you know? And for me, like continuing to be educated on recovery is important, you know? And um, the th new things that we found and, you know, like when I got sober, emotional sobriety wasn't necessarily a term that I heard a lot about um, in recovery. And I wish I had, I mean, I really wish I had because I didn't know what it was until I didn't have it and then I needed to get some and emotional sobriety is like you know it's past the drink it's past the drug it's when you don't have a sober state of mind like and I don't mean like you're thinking about using what I mean is that um, you have no spiritual foundation in your life you know you just aren't making very good choices and you're not really accountable and um, it can be a pretty dark place, you know? And I think it's what happens to people that don't, like, find, have some kind of spiritual outlet or don't work 12-step programs or aren't replacing the drug or the alcohol with something, you know? Because, like, the thing is, is that, I mean, it's there for a reason. Like, there's a reason why, you know, drugs and alcohol, like, numb us or make us not have to think about things or, you know... 
even if we have a predisposition for addiction, they still work for us on some level. And so I think it's like going in and taking a look constantly, you know, at your fears. I mean, just because you're sober doesn't mean you're not going to have fear in life, right? And um, I think like one of the major, like one of the things that is sad to me is like kind of the misconception that like, once somebody goes through treatment or once somebody gets like gets sober, they're gonna be sober forever. Well, that's just not the case. I mean, people relapse all the time, you know? And um, I'm like thinking back on my sobriety, it's weird. Like, I'm like thinking back on like the closest I've ever come to, sobri to relapsing. And you know, I honestly like, I think it's like really important like that, you know, in remembering that this wasn't my first time at the rodeo. Like, when I went to treatment for the last time was not my first treatment. I mean, it was my fifth treatment, you know? And I had had many situations where I had tried to quit drinking and using on my own. Like, many where I had really tried to quit on my own. Like, where I would wake up and say, you know, okay, this is the last day that I'm going to use. And this is the last day that I'm going to drink and starting tomorrow. Like, and even if I didn't say it to people, you know, because it I got to a point where I wouldn't tell people, you know, because I didn't want them holding it over my head. Well, I thought you quit drinking or I thought you said you weren't smoking weed anymore, or eating pills, you know, like I didn't want to hear it anymore. Um, <laughs> I was telling a friend the other day, I said something about um, she doesn't know a lot about addiction. And I said, well, there's a test. On, I mean, she knows a lot about addiction, but she doesn't know a lot about recovery, I guess. She knows enough, but she's not in recovery. And she said something, and I said, you, well, there's a test online that you can take. There's like a pamphlet, you know, and it says like, are you, you might be an alcoholic or something like that. I can't, it's like a test. You could take a test online to see if you're like an alcoholic or an addict. And, um... And I said, but like the alcoholic one, I said it's like 10 questions and if you answer yes to two or more, chances are you're an alcoholic. I said, but when you take the test, it's kind of trickery. I said, because the, the, like if, you, if you're like my age and you've been drinking for a long time, you know, the questions are things like, have you ever been late to work because of drinking? Well, like everybody probably that drinks, you know, over a course of time has had one morning where they maybe drank too much the night before and they, you know, got up late. Okay. Have you ever like, and it's like all these questions that like, I mean, you could probably answer eight out of 10 of them and think you're like the most hardcore alcoholic in the world, you know, but, um, you know, I don't know. Like when I, when I came in this last time, I just, there was something about me that was so different than the times before. I think the other thing too was that like, you know, there have been periods where it was like spaced out, like my attempts, but in the last year or two, like the last two years before, um, it was like, you know, I would have periods where like I was in an, an outpatient program, you know, like I would have like six months where I was in an outpatient program and I would do okay, you know, like I wouldn't drink so much through the week. I do remember like at the end, um, it stopped. Okay, so anyway, um, I was in this outpatient program, you know, for a long time. I told this story on here before and my dad would come to family night and stuff like that and there was a really long period of time where I was very serious about it and then um, I like something changed and it just like overnight like something happened and um, I just was like not about all that anymore. I think it was I had gone to this like my friend's dad had a cabin in southern Indiana and I had gone down there for the weekend or maybe just a night with like her and a bunch of friends and she actually at the time went to Indiana University so I like met her down there and um, so we were like sitting around and they were like playing a, a drinking game. This is when I was in the outpatient program. And um, and so they were playing some drinking game and I was just like kind of not really doing anything. And so then I started playing and, but I was like, I'll just play it with Coke or something. And I don't know, sooner or later I was playing, I was drinking and it like took like literally like I was right back in it again, you know? And then that like, I remember she said something to me about like, 
I, I just didn't realize it was that bad for you. Like, it, I mean, I got real out of control. And, um, and then it, I was back. But I was still having to do the outpatient program because of legal stuff. So, um... And my dad was still participating in it for family nights. And he was like, you know, missing out on board meetings and stuff like that. This is like the buildup of the anger that my dad had towards me and, and the disease of addiction. And so, um, I had a really close friend of mine at the time. She and I, um, were like, we went to school together and we were real involved and stuff at like school kind of. And so she lived close to me and she lived with her sister at the time and she and I would kind of just like hang out just the two of us the whole weekend and um we would like sit around we like so we used to uh like tape these radio shows like we would like just drink the whole weekend i can remember like i would wake up on sunday and i would like drink all this water i was just like so nervous to get it out of my system, but I would like drink from like Thursday to sat Saturday, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I would drink because Thursday night was like my last night of like my IOP. And so then I would drink, like I would come home and like she would come over and like we would, you know, drink Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And we like, so, you know, like, uh, the, what do you call it? Tape cassette thing. So we would sit there and we would have like blank tapes and we would act like we had this radio show and we would, this is so funny, like in retrospect, thinking about like the YouTube and stuff and this being like a podcast, I guess, kind of, but like we would drive around or not drive around. No, we, uh, we would sit in the living room and we would like play music and we would say, and the next one's by the Cranberries. And then we would come back on and we would like interview each other and ask each other questions and stuff. God, I wonder if I have any of those tapes anywhere, but, um, I can remember I would listen to them like, you know, the next day and then we were just so drunk, right? And the other thing was that like we were writing partners and so we would write these stories together. I've actually found some of them in my basement and they're really good. <laughs> like, I'm like, we wrote these stories completely intoxicated, which interestingly enough, like, I mean, when you think about some people that were you know, creative, like, geniuses were, he, like, really heavy drinkers, you know? Fitzgerald and Hemingway were huge drinkers, you know? And, um, you know, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, you know, all these people that we were huge, you know, alcoholics and addicts. And, um, I remember that I had this teacher for jazz poetry, I still remember his name. He was fantastic. And um, he, had wrote, he had written a book. It was so cool. And um, I remember I like wrote a, I had a poem for his class or something anyway. And he wrote on there like, like he knew, he could tell like I had a problem. My, my, a lot of my teachers did. And he said, do not burn out in a frenzy of creativity like Janis Joplin. He wrote on there like Janis Joplin or Jimi Hendrix, you know, and these people. And, um, I always remember that, you know? Sometimes other people have the sight to see what we need when we don't, but we don't trust that, you know? Um, I did a whole video on this, but I had this experience where um, I took this Victorian literature class. So my undergraduate degree is in English. It was a focus on creative writing. And um, I took this Victorian literature class and I had this professor. And um, like I didn't go to class like ever. Like I just never went. And she finally, like one day, like I went, I had to like, okay, so we read Middle March by George Eliot and I had to write a paper on it. And the only reason I remember is because, I mean, this is the years before Audible and all that kind of stuff, right? I mean, this, I think Middle March by George Eliot is like 1200 pages. And I had to write this like ridiculous paper on it. And I don't remember reading the book. I mean, I literally skimmed this book in an entire day and just sat there and drank. But anyway, I showed up to turn in this paper, and um, she was standing in the doorway. 
And she wouldn't let me in the door. And she was like, people are complaining that you smell like alcohol, blah, 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 whatever. And I was like, really shitty about it. And I was like, whatever. And she's like, you need to go withdraw from the class. And um, I was like, I could not believe it. I was like, seriously, I cannot believe this, right? So flash forward. I told this on here again not too long ago, but I did a whole video about it on my Peterisms channel. So when I was working in treatment and then going to my office, I had, um, I would stop at Starbucks on the way. And there was this one day that I had to like, I, my window wasn't where I was driving I think my ex's car and it, the window wouldn't work to go down so I had to like go in to get coffee it was all weird it was all like this god moment stuff that happened the way that it was supposed to and so I went into Starbucks and this woman was standing in front of me and she was asking for a pencil to do the crossword and the guy was like being really rude to her and um so finally he gives her a pencil and she's like thank you and she turned and I was like <gasps> And like I knew it was her. Like she didn't look one day different, right? And at this point, it would have been like, I mean, it would have been some time. It would have been like 10 years. So she came back up, because something was like wrong with the pencil. It wasn't sharp or whatever. And she was like, she said to the guy, because she was like, could you sharpen my pencil? And he was like, he was, I, I can't remember how it all went, but he was real rude to her anyway. I was like, man, just give her a pencil. <laughs> like, you know, and like at that point I knew who she was. And um, so she turned around and she said, thank you. And like, I was like walking to the door and she like stood right in front of me. And I was like, I said her name and she said, Peter Mon. She was like, Peter Mon. And I was like, I don't know why like this story always gets me so emotional like you know I don't know why this story it, 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 all these professors like at the time that I had her as a professor I could care less about her I didn't like she wasn't somebody that like I adored or anything like that I just think it was the fact that like somebody remembered me you know I always felt like most of my life I was forgettable have you ever felt that way you're expendable you know, like, my parents never made me feel that way. You know, my parents always made me feel like I was really important. But I feel like my classmates and even some of my friends, you know, growing up. I mean, it's a feeling I've had for the majority of my life that I'm just expendable to people. I just don't matter. And that acknowledgement, I think, that she knew who I was, you know. And she looked at me, she goes, how are you doing? You know, I was like, I'm great. And so I sat there for a second and I, um, I told her, I said, you know, like I'm working in a treatment facility. I'm, I'm a counselor and, um, you know, I've got my master's degree and, um, and she just looked at me and she was like, you know, she was like, oh my God, I'm so proud of you. And, you know, she said, we never get to find out like what happens to our students, you know? And, um, and I remember she like, she looked at me and she said, uh, before I like walked out, she like gave me a hug and she was like, um, like, cause I mean, I think we knew we were never going to see each other again. Like, why would we under what circumstances, you know? And she looked at me and she said, have a great, she said something like have a wonderful life or have a great life or something like that. It was just like, it was so powerful. I just, and I got to make amends to her, like in that conversation about, you know, we're, we're taught in recovery not to make spur of the moment amends, right? That you should always, like, talk it out with somebody. But I did get to make amends to her about, you know, like, walking into her classroom drunk and disrespecting her. And See, if I start thinking about things, and I'll start wondering, like where this person is, and where this person is, and where this person is, and... This girl that I used to write with, she and I, like, we did all kinds of stuff together in the English department. I mean, we sat on, like, all kinds of boards together, and uh, ran stuff together, and um, I, like, a couple years ago, like, I literally, oh, I just told this story on here not too long ago. Um, 
I finally like found her and we talked for a little bit, but it had been so long and um you know it's weird how like time goes by. <laughs> when I was drinking towards the end I had this friend of mine, a really, really good friend of mine. And he was somebody that like my mom knew and like my, my dad and my stepmom knew and he was a really good guy. We just happened to party together a lot. But he always looked out for me, you know? And it was never anything more than that. There were never any like, you know, romantic feelings towards each other, no, nothing sexual, nothing like that. And, um, like he reached out to me, like on Facebook. God, it's been like four or five years now. I can't remember, but anyway. I remember calling him up on the phone and I sat there and I talked to him for like, I mean, over an hour. And it was like no time had gone by, you know? And, um, and we're like, yeah, we need to get together for lunch. We need to get together and, you know, like catch up and whatever. I mean, it literally had been like, I mean, I really hadn't seen him since my first year sober. <laughs> And, um, and it wasn't because of his using, like, I, I, he was somebody that I thought I wouldn't be able to continue to hang out with, but, like, he, like, went back to school, and he, like, stopped drinking and using, he, like, lives a <laughs> pretty simple life today, lives out in the middle of nowhere, and has, like, a very serious job, and, but anyway, so, you know, I mean, it had been, like, what, at that point, like, 19, 20 years since I'd seen him, I mean, that's a long time, you guys, like, that's crazy, you know? And, um, it's like the one trick about getting older is that sometimes in your head, stuff doesn't feel old. Like when you're thinking about a memory from high school or whatever, like this book that I'm reading that unlovable, by <laughs> Tammy Pierce, it reminds me so much of high school. And it's like reminding me of people, you know, and like in my head, like it really doesn't feel like some of my memories from these people are that long ago, but in reality, it's been 30 years. 30 years since I've seen them. Almost 40 years since some of us were, like, put together, you know? Like, that's crazy. And, um... So, anyway, you know, we, we said to each other that day on the phone, we were like, you know, oh, we've got to get together more. We've got to get together more. Get together, period. And have lunch and, like, catch up and whatever. And he's like, yeah. It never happened. But going back to that outpatient thing, so I was in this outpatient program and I just wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. But like, I would always start these like outpatient or day treatment or inpatient program, I, you know, programs like on a high note. Like I would always be like, I'm really serious about it. I like, I really would, you know? Like I would go into it and I would be like inspired, you know? But then like within a matter of time, I just was like, I didn't want to do it, and I didn't feel like I could do it. And so, I made it through this whole outpatient program. And I remember we were walking out at the end. And I got like this, you know, little coin or whatever for graduating. And my dad said something to me about, I can't remember what he said, but I said, I, yeah, I deserve an Oscar for that performance. And he goes, what are you talking about? And I, like, real glib said, I mean, I've been drinking the whole time. Like, I drink on the weekends. You know, it's fine, Dad. It's not any big deal. But he was so pissed. He was like, do you know what I've had to, like, move around to be here for these family groups for you? He's like, do you know that I've, like, had to, like, move all of this shit around to, like, you know, cancel board meetings and all this kind of stuff to be here for you? He goes, you have, did you even know that? And, like, the thing is, is that that's what, like, drinking and drugging, I think, does for us is, like, yes, I, I probably did know that. And I probably did have some kind of emotional response to it at that time. But I didn't want to feel it. So my response to it is, like, okay. I think, you know, like, over time, like, people's response to life, if they're not alcoholics and addicts, you know, I think, like, this just, just, screw it. Like, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care, you know? I think that attitude 
it's such a sad attitude to have, you know? Like, when I witness that in people, that, like, I don't give a shit attitude, yeah? You know what I mean? Like, about anything. It's really sad, because I think, like, because I've been there, and it's really a mask to say, like, if somebody's coming at you, right, and they're, like, attacking you, and you go, well, I don't care, screw you, I don't care, what you're really saying is, I really care very deeply, and that hurts me, and I don't like it, but we don't want to appear weak, so we just act like we don't care, we act like we're without emotion, you know? When we hurt other people, and we're in, and they bring it to our attention, or if we hurt other people, and we're in recovery, and we're hurting people, you know, by our actions, like I did with my dad, that situation, I don't care, because if I care, then I have to address my emotions, and I don't want to do that. People are afraid of their emotions. I think a lot of people are afraid of their emotions. Hell, I've been afraid of my emotions most of my life. This Peter that you see that cries in a car over a teacher that he had when he was in college is, is not the Peter that the majority of the people in my life knew for much of my life. They would say, oh yeah, Peter was happy and Peter was fun, but no, Peter didn't cry. No, Peter never cried. What are you talking about? It was tough, you know? I had to be. So anyway, I think like what happened was, you know, I had gone through all these programs and I had tried to quit so many times on my own that, I mean like literally would like pour alcohol out drunk, I mean, while I was drunk, pouring it out and be like, I'm not ever drinking again. And then I would wake up the next day and be like, why did I pour all that alcohol out? I want to drink so bad, you know? And, um, So, I think the last time that I went into treatment, I think it was a mixture of my dad saying, I've had enough of your bullshit. I'm not helping you out anymore. You can be homeless. I don't care. I think it was him cutting everybody off from my life because nobody would talk to me. And my dad, I don't know. I mean, it, it, you can call it manipulative. You can call it what you want. You can call it smart because it was good parenting. It was what it was. But he called everybody I possibly knew and said, if you care about my son, do not talk to him. If he calls you, hang up the phone. He's just going to try to like, you know, get you to come and get him. So I really had nowhere to go. And then I think it was having really strict boundaries when I got out. And I think it was this total fear of being homeless. But at the same time, I was so tired. Like, I just was tired. I was done. I was so done. I was so tired. I just couldn't do it anymore. I just really, really couldn't do it anymore, you know? And, um... It was interesting. I got this comment on a video the other day. I don't think it was on my vlog. I think it was on... Uh, I don't remember what channel it was on, but somebody said, you've been sober for 24 years and you still talk about sobriety like every day. Like, basically, like, look at what this says about you. I, if I live to be 100 and I'm sober th that long, I will talk about it every day. It's my favorite topic to talk about. Um, it's the topic that I'm most interested in. It's the topic that I'm most invested in and talking about because I still see each when I tell these stories, there are still bits and pieces of myself that I don't understand from back then that I kind of work out by talking about it. You know, there are still fears of mine that I have that I, I, I haven't completely resolved. There are resentments that I have that I'm still working through, you know, not from t 25 years ago, but from, you know, a year ago or five years ago. And, um, you know, and by telling my story, I hope there's somebody out there that goes, God, I've tried to quit a lot of times too, and I didn't make it. If Peter did it, maybe, maybe I can, you know, maybe the next time it will be. So I will always talk about it. I love talking about sobriety and addiction. And I think it's needs to be talked about more. There aren't enough YouTubers out there talking about it. You know, I'd dedicate a whole channel to it if I could, but, um, so, you know, like, I think what happened the last time was I just was so tired. I just, I really was felt boxed in. Like, there was nowhere for me to go um, as far as, like, you know, like, nobody was going to take me in. And I just think I realized I was done. It was just done, you know? But I didn't have this overwhelming excitement to get sober like the times that I had before. Like, it wasn't like I walked in and I was, like, excited about it, you know? Like, I very 
much did not want to be sober. My, <laughs> I just didn't. I had no desire to be, you know. I don't know that it wasn't that I had a desire to be sober. I think it was that I didn't have a desire to um, do the work or something. You know what I mean? Like, I just didn't have any desire to do the work. And um, I didn't know what that meant. And, you know, I understood what it was like to get a sponsor. Okay, like, I, when I was in this outpatient program, you guys, this is so funny. I forgot about this. I mean, it's not funny. It's really sad, honestly. But... So, my friend, the one whose cabin I went to, so she dated this guy. They were both bartenders at the time at this bar in uh, Broader Pool called the Alley Cat. It's still there. Oh my God. <laughs> Spent so many nights there. But anyway, so because nobody, like, this is how much I thought people, like my IOP counselor, would really care, okay? You want to talk about addict, alcoholic mind? Here you go. I paid him to memorize the 12 steps because at some point my counselor had to call and make sure that this guy was really my sponsor. And so since I didn't want to get a sponsor because I wasn't really going to meetings, I had my uh, friend's boyfriend, I paid him like, I don't know, 50 bucks or something to memorize the 12 steps. And then when the guy called him, he would have to like recite him and tell him what steps we were calling him. Well, which the guy never even called him. I don't think he ever called him. But anyway, um, like, I, that never happened, and, like, I graduated with the, from the program with Flying Colors. But those were the links that I was willing to go to. Because I didn't know what it meant. I mean, like, if I had even given it any bit of effort, you know, and actually gone to some meetings or found out. Like, I mean, I had gone to meetings, but, like, I wasn't regularly going to meetings. If I had taken, if I was willing to even just give it a try... You know, and go to meetings a little bit and get a sponsor, even if I didn't know what that was because I was scared of what that meant. I didn't know what it meant, so that scared me, right? So if I was even willing to try just a little bit and be like, okay, I'm going to try this and see what this is, I could have gotten in earlier maybe. But although I do believe, I, I, you know, I'm a believer that, you know, wherever you are is exactly where you're supposed to be in your journey. I believe I got sober when I was supposed to get sober. You know, when I first got sober, the interesting thing is I felt screwed. Like, I felt screwed over. Like, I, I, there's all these old people in here. I had the, I should have been able to get sober when I was, you know, in my 40s or 50s. I got cheated out of, you know, 15 more years of good drinking time. That's how I felt. I was going to stop. Hold on. But now I'm like, I wish I had gotten sober at you know, 17 or something like that. I mean, there's so many young people in sobriety now, you know. There's a few young people. I mean, I hear leads every once in a while where um, somebody will say they got sober. Like, I went to this convention with Tanya and the woman, uh, actually with my sponsor too, and um, we met her there. And the woman that told her story she had as long as I did. Or, I mean, she had longer than I did. We were about the same age. And she got sober at like 13. I was like, oh my God. Could have been me though, you know. I'm just glad that I finally got it at some point. I think that, you know, there's so many people out there that will never get it, never have a chance. And that's sad. Makes me sad. You know, all that stuff that, like, we talk about, you know, like, oh, get a sponsor, do service work, go to meetings, all this kind of stuff. It was so terrifying to me. All of it was terrifying to me. Every bit of it. You know, I still don't love going to meetings by myself. Like, that, I, I've talked about that on here before. My social anxiety is so bad that for me to just, like, walk into a meeting that I've never been to before by myself, I don't love that. Uh, I don't even, like, love going to meetings that I do go to by, my, by myself. I just don't like doing that. But, you know what? There was a year where I did it, and I was going to all candlelight meetings, and it was two, two years. I was going to all candlelight meetings, and I went to all kinds of meetings that I, I didn't know anybody there, and, you know, and it was good for me. It was really, really good for me. Um, you 
you know, got me out of my comfort zone. But like all the stuff, like having to get a sponsor and, you know, that's still nervous to me. It makes me nervous, to, you know. I told my sponsor, she said something. I said, oh no, you're not getting away from me. I said, you're my sponsor for the rest of my life. I said, I'm not getting any more new sponsors. She started laughing on the phone. She goes, well, I don't want any, I don't want you to have to get anybody else either. I'm like, I'm not getting any more new sponsors. I've had enough. I said, you're my sponsor for life now. I said, you can't get rid of me. <laughs> Surprised she didn't say, well, we can inventory that fear. <laughs> oh my gosh. But anyway. What a gift, you know? What an absolutely incredible gift that today I look at at 46 years old and I think to myself, the greatest thing that ever happened to me in my entire life was that I got sober. And this is not brainwashing, you know? This is this is evidence as a result of my life. That the greatest thing that ever happened to me was that I got sober. But when I got sober, I fought it tooth and nail. Like, I did not want it. And I was scared of it, and I didn't know what it meant. I didn't, these words that they would use, I didn't understand. And these steps were old-timey and Bible-thumper-ish to me. And it, God this and God that. And I just was so, just, just enough, enough, enough. You know, I just didn't want to hear any of it, you know? And then at some point, I just, I got tired, and I just gave in. And I just was like, okay, beat me with your steps. You know what I mean? Like, I... I give up. Okay, so if all it takes is me having to try this for a little while, well, I'll try it. Okay, what do I have to lose? And that's literally what I did, you know? It wasn't like I walked in and like had this huge desire. I mean, I think there's this misconception. And every time I say this, somebody always gets upset about this in the comment section, but you know, this whole idea that, you know, you have to want to get sober. No, that's bullshit. You do not have to want to get sober. I did not want to get sober. December 17th, okay, or December 16th, the night before, my plan was not to, you know, wreck my car and have to go into treatment as the only other option besides jail. That When I woke up that day, I wasn't thinking that was where I was going to end up that night, okay? That's where I ended up that night as a circumstance of my behaviors and a consequence of my choices. But I didn't wake up that morning and think that, you know? I have seen so many people get court ordered treatment that have stayed sober. I've seen a lot that have gotten court ordered to treatment that never stay sober too. You know, they just don't ever get it and that breaks my heart as well. But I've seen my fair share of people that have been court ordered to treatment and you know, 90 means in 90 days or you know, whatever. Five meetings a week for a year. I've seen some in the area like where I'm at right now in the north side of Indianapolis, there's work release programs. I mean, some of these people that are in work release, they have to like walk to meetings, to work, everything, you know. I mean, some of these people are my friends, you know. It's like they feel like they're never going to get out of it. So, you know, I'm always like, have you ever thought like, okay, I have nothing to lose. I'm stuck in this program for a year or two, you know, whatever. And they're like, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. You know, I've seen wives look at husbands and vice versa and say, if you don't pull your shit together, I'm gone and I'm done. And I'm like filing for divorce. And I've seen people turn their lives around as a result of that. And I've seen other people lose their husbands and wives and kids and families and everything. So I'm not saying that I always think it works, but what I'm saying is I don't think that you have to have a desire when you walk in the door. I mean, you can feel forced, you know what I mean? You can do it because you want the positive consequences, uh, not because you really want to be sober. I didn't want to be sober. I just wanted people off my ass. <laughs> and I, I didn't want to be homeless. Like, that was my fear. I was terrified of that, you know? I mean, literally terrified. I knew. I knew, looking in my father's eyes, he was done. I mean, he was absolutely done with me. And I had nowhere to go. I mean, I had no skills. I had no money. I had no idea how I was going to take care of myself, you know? So, you know, it's crazy when I look back on my life that this thing that started for me probably, you know, when I was in the womb, 
as you know, I do believe that I was predisposed to be an addict and alcoholic. Um, <clears throat> but that I started actively drinking and you know drugging in junior high and high school, and then this is had nowhere on my radar for what I would end up doing would end up being something that I did for a long period of my life, you know, that I ended up going to work in a treatment facility and becoming a counselor and working with a team of addiction experts and speaking to people about addiction, you know, all across the Midwest and going to conferences and speaking and, you know, um, getting my master's degree and, you know, specialized training and all of that stuff, like... I remember taking my last class. I've talked about this on here too, but <laughs> I was thinking about this the other day. I remember taking my or taking my last test in my last class of my master's program, and like I didn't have a cell phone at the time, I don't think, and I like pulled over this gas. Maybe I did, I don't know, but I pulled over at this gas station. It's on Delaware in downtown Indianapolis. And I called my mom and I was so excited. And I was like, mom, guess what? She was like, what? And I was like, I took my last exam ever. And she was like, well, you might want to get your PhD. I was like, no, I don't want to get my PhD. <laughs> I'm done, I'm done with school. I loved being in graduate school though. I really, really did. You know, a lot of the people that came to the MSW program, Masters in Social Work program, they came from the BSW program. So they already had a lot of that knowledge, but I didn't. I came from an English background. And so like, I didn't know a lot of this stuff, you know, that we learned about. It was so interesting to me. Um, some of the things that I we learned in there were just like, I mean, I still remember to this day. I took this class. Um, and we read this book, and it was like, the, the class was like working in school systems or something like that, and we read this book called, I think it was called Fist, Knife, Gun, and it was this guy, and he talked about violence in society, and how like in the 50s, like it had been, um, like, pe like people in like school systems would like fight each other with like, you know, you have to remember, I was in graduate school in the late 90s, so this was, like, written probably before, you know, obviously before that. But, um, that, like, people in the 50s and the early 60s would fight each other with, like, you know, like, fight each other, physically fighting each other. But then, like, in the late 60s and early 70s, it turned to, like, knife, like, knives became, like, the way that people fought each other. And then, um, you know, in, like, the, the... 80s and 90s, it was a gun. People fought with guns. But aggression and violence really never changed. Like, the way people felt never really changed. Um, it was just the mode of violence changed. And I remember thinking that was so interesting, you know, that, like, if we looked at how we thought inside, and then, like, you know, I remember, like, her talking about the way that, like, people injure themselves with like drugs and alcohol she like took it to addiction and she was like you know the drug will continue to always change but the addict really the addiction will stay the same but the, the drug will change over time right and I look at it you know and at that time like we're coming out of the 80s you know of the crack cocaine being everywhere then methamphetamine you know in the midwest and now it's heroin, you know? And I, I think, I look at that and I think, God, she was so right, you know? I took so many interesting classes. So many interesting classes. Oh well. I did think for a while that I might want to go back and get my master's in fine arts. When I kind of started thinking about like, you know, phasing out and not doing what I was doing anymore and I started that process, I was like, you know, you might want to go get your master's in fine arts somewhere. I thought that would be fun, um, you know, like for writing or something. But I didn't. <sighs> And I don't really regret it. I, w 
wouldn't say like on my list of when I go back in my life, I think about things I wish I had done, you know. I mean, it's kind of funny how I got into the master's of social work program anyway. What happened was that, well, so I have this friend of mine that I went to elementary, kindergarten, elementary, junior high, high school, college, graduate school with. And I've talked about her quite a bit on here. And um, she, so she and I went to college together. And I got my degree in English and she got her degree in psychology. And so when I got sober, I was working in a treatment program. I started there working as a tech. Well, she was working somewhere similar, but it was it didn't have anything to do with addiction. And so when she was trying to get into clinical psych programs, and I was actually, at that point, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, you know? Um, I did take the GREs for, and the subject tests to get into an MFA program at that time, or a master's in fine arts, or a master's in English, but I decided that's not what I wanted to do. Anyway, and I didn't do very well on the GREs, and I sure as shit didn't do very well on the subject GREs. Um, the only question I knew for absolute fact was uh, what book was written by Alice Walker, and I knew it was The Color Purple. So anyway, and it was like 400 questions, and I just bombed it, I was horrible. But anyway, um, I'm not good at subject taking tests. But, so anyway, the programs that she was applying to, um, this is the weirdest roundabout I've ever been to in my entire life. I took a different way tonight. I don't really know where I'm at. But anyway, um, the place that she worked at, she and I needed to, like if I was gonna become a counselor, I needed to have a master's degree in social work. Like, or I needed to have a master's degree. You could have a master's degree in counseling, master's degree in social work, you could have a master's degree in, what, uh, there were several different options. But you had to have a master's degree. And, um, to work as a counselor and so that's why I applied to the program and she was like trying to get into psych programs and she applied to a psych program and she applied to the same program as me and she didn't get into the psych program because it was only like six or ten places that they were taking spaces and she didn't get into it so she ended up going to the program with me so we were in the program together so this friend of mine, we literally went to kindergarten, elementary, junior high, high school, undergrad, and graduate school together. Can you believe that? Isn't that crazy? I'd love to get her on a video on here. I thought she would never do it. Um, I actually ran into her. God, it was like last winter sometime, and I was at Meyer late at night, I was by myself, Tanya wasn't with me, and I ran into her, and we stood there and talked forever, and she ended up, she's like, she's like, I know you, she goes, I do watch your vlogs, and she's like, I know you like fountain pop, she's like, can I get you a fountain pop here, and so, she, we bought like fountain pop, was it in the winter, maybe it was in the summer, I don't remember, but anyway, I talked about it on here, and uh, we stood and talked forever, and she and I email each other back and forth and stuff, she lives like 10 minutes from me, but, You know, you just have friendships that kind of go astray. I miss her. I mean, we were really, really close for years and years and years together. And um, she was somebody I drank a lot with too, but she like cleaned all of her stuff up. She doesn't drink at all anymore. She's family. She's all about the family now. I could not go back to school to save my life. Oh my God, I am too selfish with my time now. That was two years of like, well, I started in the fall and then that spring I had a practicum internship, but it was only like 20 hours a week. And then I took summer school I took two classes, six credit hours each semester, or each se session, two sessions. But I was also working 40 plus hours a week in treatment at the same time as a counselor in training. And then I, that fall, I had a, I was taking 15 credit hours of classes, working 40 plus hours a week, and I had a 40 week, 40 hour a week uh, practicum internship. And then I graduated in that spring. I can't believe it. It went, it seems like it went really fast though. 
and had a boyfriend and had a roommate best friend at the time. And I was working out and I was in the best shape of my life. I would come out, home, I would come home and I would be so stressed out, I would go right over to the gym in the little apartment that I lived in and I would work out. And my boyfriend and I and my old roommate at the time, she and I would go, all three of us, we would go for uh, like late night swims. Cause you could get into the pool like 24 hours and it was a really nice pool. And we would go into the pool and swim and then we would come back and uh oh. And we would make like DiGiorno frozen pizzas. I don't know why I just remember that. And then we would watch a scary movie and that was like my life. I had no social life for like two years doing that, but whatever, it was worth it. back of that I have this kind of smile on my face I look back on that time and it was kind of like some of the like in a weird way I mean it was like the poorest I've ever been in my life you know I just wasn't making any money and was you know so busy all the time but like in some ways it was kind of like there are periods of it that were like the happiest of my life if that makes sense because like I don't know why but it just you know like Things were so simple. <clears throat> Although my life is pretty simple now, you know. My husband was so sweet today. He kept on checking in on me all day long. It was weird, it was like, while I was getting it done, my jaw was really hurting because like she wouldn't give me any breaks. But it didn't really like, like really hurt because she told me she said it's gonna hurt a lot better like it never really hurt that bad it just was sore I didn't I don't know why but anyway my husband was so sweet he was like do you need me to bring you some vegetable soup I was like no and that doesn't even sound delicious but I do love soup my husband every day is like eating chicken noodle soup for lunch I'll ask him I'll say like what'd you have for lunch today and he'll say chicken noodle, noodle soup I think he gets it from Panera and I'm like, oh my God, that sounds so good. You have to be kind of careful as a vegetarian when you eat a lot of soups. Like, I always make sure at like Whole Foods which ones are vegetarian stock because a lot of them use like a beef or a chicken stock for like, and so you have to be careful. But I love soups in the winter, don't you? Do you go, oh my God, soups and chili and stew. See, I can't have stew either. Well, I guess I could have vegetable soup. Is there vegetable stew? Is that such a thing? You guys are probably like, yeah, Peter, are you a complete idiot? Well, I don't know. <laughs> it's pretty out tonight. It's just kind of real still. In the still of the night. Will you still love me? Tomorrow. How long have I been vlogging now? Okay, let's see. 23, 23, 46. I'm not very good with math. You guys know that though, don't you? You guys excited for your weekend? I'm going to LA very soon. I'm just gonna surprise you guys for when it happens. Surprise, I'm in LA. Will that surprise you? Will you like that? Will you get excited about that? <laughs> I don't think I have anything else to talk about tonight. Well, all right, you guys, listen. I'm going to get off here. I'm going to listen to my audiobook. I'm going to get like a bottle of water or something to drink. Maybe a cup of coffee while I'm listening to my audiobook. All right, I'm going to get off here. I love you guys, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.